In this video, I'm gonna share everything I've learned about reducing churn in my SaaS company, Exploding Topics. In fact, the strategies and approaches that I'm gonna share in this video helped us reduce our churn from over 10% to below 3%. Now, the reduction in churn didn't happen overnight and it took a lot of hard work as you're about to see, but it did happen somewhat quickly over the course of a few months. And in this video, I'm gonna share everything I learned about reducing SaaS churn for the first time as my first SaaS company. One of the things I learned about SaaS is that it's kind of easy to ignore churn at first. So for example, in our case, our churn early on was like, you know, seven, eight percent. It was somewhat high, but our growth was like 15 percent. So it was sort of easy to outpace churn. It's easy to increase by 10 percent every month if your MRR is like a couple thousand. But once you hit 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 and beyond, it's a lot harder to outpace your churn. And that's basically what we discovered. It's just a law of large numbers, right? Like if you're making a thousand a month with your SaaS and your churn is 10 percent, you only need to add a hundred dollars of new MRR a month to even that out. But if you're at 40,000, you need to add 4,000 of new MRR every month just to outpace churn, which is really difficult. And that's kind of the situation that we're in not that long ago where we're growing really fast, growing really fast. And then eventually we sort of hit this wall where churn put a ceiling on our growth. Like we weren't able to grow anymore. We had a sort of this come to Jesus moment where we had to figure out, okay, churn is one of those things we knew is a problem, but we really need to focus on this problem and figure out how to fix it. So all of the resources we had, we basically put into reducing churn. And I talked to other SaaS founders that I know. I read blog posts. I watch videos like this that you're watching right now. To try to figure out how to reduce SaaS churn. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. And in this video, I'm going to share everything I learned to help get our SaaS churn from around 10% to below 3% and dropping fast. The first thing that made the biggest difference was creating avatar specific features. So what do I mean by that? Well, when we first came across this churn problem, we're trying to figure it out. The instinct is just create more features like, okay, our SaaS needs this feature and that'll make the difference. And this feature, well, that'll make the difference. And we quickly learned that just adding a bunch of features is not going to impact your churn, even if those features are useful and helpful. That's when we started to create avatar specific features. What do I mean by that? Well, what we did and what I recommend you do is grab a list of your top customers your top paying customers, people that have paid you the most, probably on your highest plan and have stuck with you the longest, so haven't churned yet. So what we did is we went to Stripe and we just downloaded our customer list and sorted it by the people that paid us the most, the people that were on the highest tier and stuck with us the longest. And we figured out who are these people? Like it's one thing to say X percentage of my customers are in this field and X percent are these people, but nothing beats actually going to the individual human and saying, this is a human being who whipped out their credit card and bought our software and has stayed with us for years and just going down the list in terms of how much people have paid you and starting with the highest and working your way down. This was mind blowing for us because we knew at a high level who our customers were. VCs and investors were a big chunk. We had some people in e-commerce. We had other people in marketing, other people in R&D, but we didn't know who these people were. And there's a huge difference between knowing these sort of like, you know, generic categories and actually looking at someone's LinkedIn and looking at someone's Facebook and kind of cyber stalking them in a way and looking at them and saying, this is a real like living, breathing person. What can we build for for them. If they were our only customer, what would we build? That's basically what we did. We took our top customers and we built features just for them and ignored sort of everybody else. That ended up being a huge difference for us because we built features that when those people log in, there's something dedicated for them. It's not a random feature. It's not a slight improvement on an existing feature. It's a dedicated avatar specific feature. So let me give you two examples. One of our best customer groups are VCs and investors, like I said. By doing this exercise and actually looking at them by people, we could figure out what they wanted to see. And in general, by looking at their job title and what they did, they wanted to know startups to invest in not as much specific industries, although that was helpful. So before we had these avatar specific features, people would log in and they sort of had to drill into what we gave them to find what they wanted. So we had this big trends database, which is 14,000 trends and the data was updated every day and it was categorized, but it was hard to find exactly what you wanted. And when we realized that the VCs and investors in our group, they wanted startups specifically to invest in, we created a trend startups feature. That way they could log in, click a button, and they get hundreds of trending startups, most of which aren't on Crunchbase or PitchBook or any other platform. And we supplemented that with data they'd be interested in, like funding round, how many employees they have, what industry they're in, because we found when we looked at our actual customers and not just as groups, we realized that a lot of them invested in startups only in specific categories. Some were early stage SaaS startups, some were later stage health startups. And by adding these filters and additional data, they're able to drill down and find startups that are interesting to them. 
And we did the same thing with another group through this exercise that we found where a lot of people were involved in e-commerce and not just e-commerce, specifically selling on Amazon. So what did we do? Well, we said, what if this person logged in, what would they want to see? They want to see a list of trending products. Now we already had trending products, but there wasn't a dedicated avatar specific feature for them. Now there is, they log in, they click trending products and they get a list of trending products. And again, we supplemented our data with data from Amazon, like how many sales the product has, the reviews, BSR, stuff that Amazon sells would want to see. And as far as I know, this is the only product on the planet where you can see these trending startups with a click of a button. And it's an avatar specific feature. The VCs and investors probably aren't super interested in the trending products and the Amazon folks probably aren't super interested in the trending startups feature. But either way, the point is they have a feature dedicated for them as opposed to like a half a feature times 10 dedicated to them. That was night and day for us. We noticed as soon as we launched these two features that our churn started to fall off a cliff. And the biggest thing was now when those people log in, they have something dedicated just for them. So for you, I would recommend doing the same exercise. Download your best list of customers and then look at them, not as groups, but who they are as individuals and think, what would they actually want in my software? If they could log in and do something, what is the ideal thing they would do and then help them do that? As opposed to having sort of a feature for everybody that everyone can use, have something really dedicated for that group. The next thing that made a big difference for us in terms of getting new people in and getting them happy and using the product so it didn't churn was improving our onboarding sequence. So our initial onboarding sequence was kind of a mess. Like you just log in, you would get our trends database and you get all these trends, they're interesting, but you didn't really have anything personalized for you. It was just a list of trends and you had to do the work of finding trends that are relevant for you and your business. So we decided to change the onboarding process to make it a flow where you could choose categories you're interested in and we would instantly suggest trends that are really interesting interesting to you. And we wouldn't just suggest any trends. We have this sort of top tier trends list that we manually curate that we show during onboarding. That's sort of the best trends that we have to give that really strong first impression. So for example, you can log in, say I'm interested in technology and e-commerce, and you'll get all of our trends related to technology and e-commerce that are the best, that are manually literally checked off by one of our analysts to say, these are the best trends of the bunch. So you have this really strong first impression. So then after we suggest these trends, the user can then choose to try track the trends as projects. So then when they actually log in, now the entire dashboard for them is customized based on the topics that they're tracking. So before they would log in and they would get this generic trends database and they would have to do the work of looking by categories and sorting through a bunch of stuff. And now based on what topics they're tracking during the onboarding sequence, we customize the whole dashboard for them and we're suggesting more relevant trends for them. So when you log in, you're already getting a personalized experience from basically your first impression on. In fact, a lot of people would tell us like, what do I do now? Like I'm in here, I only want trends related to X. We would say, okay, you just choose this category and then sort through the stuff. It was a lot of work for them. Now they don't have to do that work. We're personalizing their whole experience for their unique use case. And this wasn't really rocket science to do, right? All we need to do is have a recommendation engine where if someone chooses trends in this category, multiple categories to track, we have an interesting trend that we recently discovered in that category suggested to them. Another thing that made a huge difference for us was to focus on annual subscriptions or just go annual only. So before we launched the SaaS version of Exploring Topics, it was just a paid newsletter because I didn't want to go down the SaaS road. It just seemed very complicated and it was easier just to create a paid newsletter of the best trends and send them out. We quickly discovered that people like that, but didn't love it because the trends weren't necessarily relevant to them, right? It couldn't be personalized, but that's kind of another story for another day. The point was when we first launched a paid newsletter, it was annual only, which is kind of the norm in the paid newsletter world. And little did we know that that was actually huge for churn in the early days because people would sign up, we gave them a trial, they would sign up, they would convert for annual and they paid for the year. Then when we switched to the SaaS model, we realized what well, we got to do monthly, right? Everyone in SaaS is doing monthly. So people signed up obviously mostly for the monthly plans and they would churn. So then we switched to having annual being like 50% discount on the year, as opposed to like a smaller discount. And that helped too, but still a lot of people still opted for monthly. Recently, we've tested going back to annual only after I saw Intercom and a couple other SaaS companies go annual only. And it's too early to say, but it seems to be helping obviously with churn because the lifetime value is gonna be a lot higher across the board. It's usually at least two X on annual plans. And the reason for that is partly like correlation is not causation. People that are really into your product are gonna sign up for an annual plan anyway, because they're like, I really believe in this. I really need this. So it's not just because they sign up for annual. It's, it's the type of person they are, but there's just the nature of the beast. Like if you push people to annual, they're less likely to churn. And if they do churn, it'll be after a year. We're still sort 
of like figuring out whether we should just do annual only or really a steep discount for annual. But either way, we've realized that sort of one of the keys to reducing churn is getting as much people on an annual plan as you can. One other thing I'd recommend you try that I've seen a lot of people do is if you do a promotion or a discount, which we don't do, but if you do that, make it only apply to annual plans. So if you do a Black Friday discount, say you can get whatever, 70% off on annual plans. That'll push more people to annual plans. The last thing that helped us reduce our churn was to provide passive value. So what does that mean? So if you've been in SaaS for a while, you probably realize the number one reason that people cancel is because I don't use it anymore. That's what they say. It's usually not because you're missing a feature or they ran into a bug or they had some problem. It's usually because they're not using the thing so they cancel, which is just logical, right? You're not using something, you're gonna cancel. So instead of putting the onus on them to use it, on them to log in and remember to get value out of it, think of a way you can provide passive value with your SaaS. For example, in the case of exploding topics, we provide email reports every week. Every week, whether you log in or not, you get an email report with our absolute best trends, along with insight and analysis into why that's trending and what might be you know, happening in the future with that trend. That way, you don't need to log in to get value. Every week, you're getting value no matter what. Or my buddy Justin at Transistor FM, which is a podcast hosting platform. You just need to host your podcast on there. You don't need to log in and do anything. This is totally different than most SaaS where you need to log in and do something to get value out of it. So think of like the SEO tools out there. You need to log in and actually use it to get value as opposed to something like Transistor FM. You just need to upload your podcast and it takes care of the rest. And a more extreme version of this is an API tool like Banner Bear where it works sort of automatically in the background. Like every time I publish a blog post, it creates an image for social media out of it. So you don't even need to log in at all. You just need to basically sign up, log in once. And from then on, it provides value passively over time. So you don't need to remember to use it, remember to log in, figure it out. It just provides passive value value, which means people are less likely to churn. So to quickly recap the most important things that helped us reduce our churn from around 10% to below 3%, first create avatar specific features. Look at your best paying customers, the people that are just huge hardcore fans of what you're building and create features specifically for them that they can go in, click a button and get value right away. The next step is to nail your onboarding sequence. And ideally you'd use the onboarding sequence as a way to personalize their experience and make it easier for them to get value out of the product. In our case, when people track topics to a product, Project, we're using that behind the scenes to suggest relevant trends for them. That way they don't need to dig as much through our trends database. We present trends that are relevant for them without them needing to do anything special. Next up is to really focus on annual plans. Think of ways you can get more people on annual plans. Is it a steeper discount running a promotion that only applies to annual plans? Is it giving some bonus features or bonus support if someone signs up for an annual plan? It's important to think of ways that you can get more people on annual plans. It's one of the best ways to reduce churn. Last up is to provide passive value with your SaaS. Now, even if your SaaS is like exploring topics where the real value is logging in and using it, think of a way you can add value without people needing to log in, whether that's email reports that they get on a regular basis, whether it's an API feature that automatically plugs into the dashboard or something that just does something behind the scenes like web hosting, where they don't need to actually log in to use it. They're getting value just by it sort of existing. So now I'd like to hear from you. Is there anything that worked really well to help you reduce churn at your startup? Let me know by leaving a comment below and I'll see you in the next video.